Good evening. Good evening. I'd like to welcome each one of you here. We're glad God has brought you here to this place to gather again in the presence of fellow believers and in the light of His Word. Jesus says to us that where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am also. But he also says this, and this is our call to worship in John chapter 17, verse 24. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Here and now, we have the promise that when we gather in the name of Christ, He is with us. And we gather here in anticipation that we will be gathered into His presence in the new heaven and the new earth. And we will see His glory, delight in His glory, and be loved by our Heavenly Father as our Savior Jesus is loved. And that moves our hearts to worship here in the midst of whatever circumstances we find ourselves. In the midst of grief or sorrow, joy or gladness, we look forward to that day when we will share in the glory of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's take a moment of silent prayer to prepare our hearts to enter into worship of our triune God. Let us pray. I invite you to turn to 170 in the gray hymnal, O God, our help in ages past, 170.
And our God greets you here this evening. In the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with your hearts. Amen. At this time, I invite you to profess your faith with the words of Heidelberg Catechism, question and answer one. If you need the words, it's page 861 in the back of the gray hymnal. People of God, what is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong, body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Amen. Let's turn to 269. We give you but your own. 200, sorry, 296. 296. prayer. Are there any prayer requests or concerns, joys, or praises? Our God delights to hear our prayers. Rich was his name. So we want to continue to pray for Rich, the Safe Water International Ministries rep who's traveling around in India. And he's been there for a couple of weeks and has a few weeks to go yet. He's covering a lot of territory and giving thanks for safe travels and safety in that uh, country. And we pray for the blessing of his and the other people there associated with that ministry and their work sharing the gospel and clean water in that country.
Hmm. Todd and Angie and family are giving thanks after doctor's reports this week that say the, the treatments are working well and the surgeons are saying the tumors can be removed. And so thank you, Lord, and we pray he continues working and uh, sustaining you in the midst of this. Pray for Peoria Christian School as they're still looking for a couple of teachers. Um, that God would guide the candidates that they would like there, that he wants there. And I'm giving thanks that Caleb seems to be growing well. And uh, just pray for rest. <laughs> it's that newborn baby phase where there's sleep is something you get a lot less than you like. <laughs> Let's come. I'm going to read Psalm 9 as our entry into prayer. Psalm 9, it's 530 in the Pew Bible, if you'd like to follow along. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonders. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. My enemies turn back. They stumble and perish before you. For you have upheld my right and my cause. You have sat on your throne judging righteously. You've rebuked the nations and destroyed the wicked. You've blotted out their name forever and ever. Endless ruin has overtaken the enemy. You've uprooted their cities. Even the memory of them has perished. The Lord reigns. He's established His throne for judgment. He will judge the world in righteousness. He will govern the peoples with justice. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name will trust in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to the Lord enthroned in Zion. Proclaim among the nations what he has done. For he who avenges blood remembers. He does not ignore the cry of the afflicted. O Lord, see how my enemies persecute me. Have mercy and lift me up from the gates of death, that I may declare your praises in the gates of the daughter of Zion and there rejoice in your salvation. The nations have fallen into the pit they have dug. Their feet are caught in the net they have hidden. The Lord is known by His justice. The wicked are ensnared by the work of their hands. The wicked return to the grave. All the nations that forget God. But the needy will not always be forgotten. Nor the hope of the afflicted ever perish. Arise, O Lord, let not man triumph. Let the nations be judged in your presence. Strike them with terror, O Lord. Let the nations know they are but men. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, God Almighty, our Creator, our Sustainer, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, and Holy Spirit, our Counselor. We come before you giving thanks for the words of this psalm that remind us that you are judge and that you judge righteously and justly, that you uphold the cause of the afflicted and the oppressed, that you will not let the wicked flourish forever, but you will bring them down. 
that even the memory of them is forgotten. Lord, this side of your heaven, this side of Christ's return in the new heaven and the new earth, we cannot help but remember the wicked in their effects. Lord, we see it in our world around us. We see the effects in our lives. And we grieve and we cry out with the psalmist, have mercy on us. Lord, we praise you for your faithfulness in the midst of this sin-torn world. Your gracious saving us and preserving us and blessing us with family and friends and work. The measure of health. The ability to live for you. Lord, we long for that day when you bring about your justice, your judgment perfectly at Christ's return. When you banish evil not only from the world, but also from our hearts completely. So that it no longer lingers and hinders and entangles us as we seek to follow you. Lord, we pray that we would bring this message out. That the whole world may hear. Lord, we give you thanks with um, SWIM, Safe Water International Ministries, that Rich, their board member, is having a good t- trip and effective, safe travels, and that you've protected him from harm as he works to equip local leaders and ministries in India and makes his way to Nepal. Lord, we pray that you continue to guard and guide and bless his labors. That your name might go forth and your gospel shine brightly in that land covered in the darkness of Hinduism and Islam. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. You are the great physician. You are the one who knit us together in our mother's wombs. You know how sin makes our bodies go wrong with cancer like Todd's. And you were the one who also enabled us as human beings to discover treatments. And we give you thanks that Todd and Angie received a good report. That the treatments are working and the surgeons are sure they can take the tumor out. Lord, that is good news and we give you thanks for it. We pray for continued sustaining and encouragement on their journey. Keep their eyes fixed on Christ and not on cancer. The hope they have no matter how things turn out. God our Father, we pray for the Peoria Christian School as they are looking for teachers. Lord, you know the people you have ordained to teach at this school. And we pray that you would make those connections. That the the board might interview and find uh, qualified candidates to teach in the classroom there. Give them patience as they wait and wisdom as they seek to look in various places. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for um, Caleb doing well, growing, healthy. and We pray that you would continue to guard his health and continue to help him to grow and develop to the person that you want him to be. I pray you give rest and sleep, especially to Charla. Give her the strength she needs as she cares for him. Heavenly Father, we pray for our families in our congregation, for the mothers and fathers with little children, with middle, uh, middle school children, with high school children, with children out of the house and in their establishing their own families. We pray, Lord, that you would enable our families to be godly places. Places where children are discipled to know and love Jesus. And we pray that each one of us here would be a a brother, an older brother or older sister in Christ to any of the children in this congregation. That you would help us to disciple them to a life of joyful serving Christ and following Him in faith. Heavenly Father, we pray for those who are unable to join us. 
We pray for those in the the rest homes whose health is not well enough to join us. The manor in Fairhaven East, the cottages. Lord, we pray that you guard and keep and encourage them. For those in their own homes and unable to come. Lord, we pray that they would experience your presence as they worship, often listening to the recording or watching on Facebook or YouTube. But also, Lord, that they would feel your presence as we, your body, remember them and visit them. We call and send cards as we pray for them, that their hearts might be lifted and they might feel the communion of the saints, the fellowship of believers. Heavenly Fathers, we take an offering this evening for um, Ryan Faber and his work as a, a missionary in Zambia teaching at Yusto Mwale University, teaching pastors there and church leaders that they might faithfully serve in your church in sub-Saharan Africa. We pray, Lord, that you keep them faithful to your word, that you give Ryan what he needs to stand in your word and to teach that your people might be built up. God, Father, we pray that you continue to guard and keep his family as they adjust to life in Africa now, that they might call that their home, for their true home is in heaven with you, so that they can call any place they live their home. Lord, give them joy as they serve as well. May you take our offering and use it mightily for your glory and the blessing of many through your kingdom. We pray this all in Jesus' precious name and God's people said, Amen. Our offering this evening is for Ryan Faber, a missionary with Resonate Global Mission. As we prepare to come to God's Word, I invite you to turn to 
280, blessed Jesus at your word, 280. I invite you to turn to Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 8, page 869, in the back of the gray hymnal. We're looking at the overview of the Apostles' Creed, questions 24 and 25, if you'd read the answers. So how are these articles, the Apostles' Creed, divided? into three parts. God the Father and our creation, God the Son and our deliverance, God the Holy Spirit and our sanctification. Since there is but one God, why do you speak of three? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because that is how God has revealed himself in his word. These three distinct persons are one true eternal God. Amen. I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 3. We're going to be referring to a lot of different scripture passages, but I wanted to pick one that shows us the three persons of the Trinity. Matthew 3, we'll read verse 13 through 17. Before we read, let's pray. Holy Spirit, you who inspired the prophets and the apostles to write down the word of God that we might know, Jesus Christ, the word of God, that we might know you, the triune God. Lord God, you are beyond our imagining. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for us to attain. And yet you reveal it to us that we might know in part, in anticipation of knowing fully when we see you face to face. And so as we reflect, Lord, on you, three persons, one God this evening, we pray that your spirit would help us to know you more, that we might love you more and serve you more and more. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Matthew 3, starting at verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. I still remember one of my first sermons going through the Heidelberg Catechism here and preaching on this Lord's Day and the Lord's Supper, and it was Ken Feinhart. He said after the service, well, good job, Pastor, but I still struggle to understand it. <laughs> and that's kind of where we're at. When it comes to the doctrine of the Trinity, it's a little like staring at the sun. With our eyes, we can't focus on it. It's too bright. The holiness of God, His personhood, His divinity is more than our minds can wrap themselves around. And we should expect that. God is infinite. We are finite. He is omnipotent. We're definitely not. He is omniscient. And we're not by a long shot. But God reveals himself here enough so that we can know him, as the Catechism says, this is how God has revealed himself in his word. When the Jehovah Witness comes to the door and says, well, where's the Trinity in the Bible? And insists that Jesus is the first creation and not actually God. How are we to respond? Well, we're to respond by going to the Bible and pointing out the passages that, as they agree, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, the Lord is one. There is one God. But then we have to continue working our way through and seeing how God reveals himself in various ways. We read passages like Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, which say, When the time had fully come, God sent His Son, a Father sending His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. There's this language of God being Father throughout the Bible. But then we look at who is Jesus, and we find many passages. For example, the beginning of John's Gospel, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, we read this, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Jehovah Witnesses will insist was a God but that doesn't follow from the Greek grammar. The word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. And so we have this language there of Jesus, the word, being in the beginning, God, and then immediately in the next verse, being with God. God. And we find this kind of language throughout the scriptures. We have the angel of the Lord speaking to Moses out of the bush 
in Exodus chapter 3. But then it changes from the angel of the Lord speaking to the Lord speaking. And we're left with who is it? Is it the angel of the Lord? Or is it the Lord? And as we look, we discover that there's a good case we can make that the angel of the Lord is the pre-incarnate Christ in many of those instances. Because no eye can see the Father, but Jesus is the image of the invisible God. So if God is going to appear in the Old Testament before Jesus has come in the flesh, the angel of the Lord speaking as God must be Jesus before he took on human flesh. And then we go to the Holy Spirit. And we have that incidence in Acts chapter 5 of Ananias and Sapphira. And when Peter is talking to them, Peter says this to Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold and after it was sold? Wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. And there, Peter puts the Holy Spirit of God and God right side by side. And so we have this language in the Bible talking about the Spirit of God, also referred to the Spirit of Jesus in other places. And the Bible leaves us with this picture of one God, but God reveals him to us as these three persons. And we have creeds, like the Athanasian Creed, which lay out these boundaries. And the Nicene Creed, it was roughly the 4th century before the church finally figured out, well, how, what can we say true about God? Even if we can't figure out exactly how it works, what are the guard loyals that we must not say? We can't say that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three different modes. Kind of like different faces on a a coin. Except for there's three faces and they're just one. That's not what it's like. It's not like water, vapor, gas, and solid. At different times it's different things. That's not what we're talking about here. But the biblical evidence is that the Father was present at creation, as was the Word, as was the Holy Spirit. At the cross of Jesus Christ, we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And because of this, we get to wrestle explaining to our children. As I remember with Sunday school, you ask them, well, who died on the cross? God? You're like, good answer. But which person? <laughs> what was his name? And, and then we get to try to say, well, Jesus is God, yes. And the Father is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. But there's only one God. Now, why do we insist on this? Other than the fact that the Bible teaches that. If there's no triune God, the very character of this world would not be what it is. In the face of a world that's divided, and either responding to that division by trying to enforce everything the same, that's kind of what we see in Islam. When Islam goes into a country, often we see that ancient Middle Eastern culture impressed on the people. And they become more and more similar to the Arabs out of Saudi Arabia. Wherever they go around the world. They have to talk the same language because you can't translate the Quran. There's a sameness with Islam that crushes out difference. Or you go to the flip side and you find this kind of modern 
postmodernism in our world where diversity is everything and you can't define me and we're all different and you struggle to wrestle with what connects us? What's common between different people when all that matters is what's different? The very character of our God as He has revealed us has unity and diversity held together. And He's knit that together into the very fabric of creation. And when we forget it, we end up with the destruction of either Islam that flattens everything out and erases much beauty. Or we end up with the chaotic diversity that just collapses upon itself because it can't build anything because there's no commonality among the postmodern secular worldview today. They can't see how to get people on different sides of political aisles or different kind of belief systems to even interact peaceably. And we look to the triune God as a God who has within Himself the one divine essence, three persons who have always been. The Father begetting the Son eternally. The Son begotten. And the Father and the Son sending the Spirit. Those three persons before creation, as the call to worship I read from John 17, verse 24, before creation, the Father was loving the Son, means that there were relationships between different people before God made anything. See, if, if we had a, a single person God like Islam teaches, there would be no relationships before creation. Allah stood independent. He needed nothing, needed no one, related to no one. And when you have that kind of a God, love is not part of His essence. Because He doesn't relate to anyone else. But the triune God, where you have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, eternally in relationship before creation, instead of power being the center of God's essence, It's not power alone, but it's also love in those relationships. The Father loving the Son, the Son submitting to the Father, the Holy Spirit serving the Father and the Son for all eternity. And that's whose image we have been made in. We are able to relate to fellow human beings who are different than us, and yet we are all made in the image of God, and we can insist on that no matter what the color of our skin or where we're from. We can hold this diversity and this unity together because that's part of how we reflect the image of God. The doctrine of the Trinity. That God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Like I said, it's looking at the Son. It's so bright, it's blurry. But it is what enables us to relate to people who are different than us. Because we find a God who reaches down to sinners. A holy God, not abandoning image bearers who turned away from Him in rebellion. But out of His love, the love that spilled over into creation, because that's why God created, so that we might share in 
the divine love that's existed from all creation spilled over again into recreation, to salvation, to bridge that gap and bring us back into relationship with Him. The triune God is the foundation of what I was talking about the past Sunday mornings. A God who speaks. And speaking is how you come to know someone. I put the sermon title, Conversation, Communion, Union. And that's what God is up to with us. You can have a conversation with someone you don't like. But by the grace of God, He speaks to us and He brings us not only from a place where we didn't like God, but we were hostile to God. He brought us to a point where we are in communion with God through Jesus Christ, His Son. And the Holy Spirit dwells in us and is bringing us to that point as John chapter 17, verse 24 put it, where Jesus is bringing us to be with Him where He is and to see His glory. The glory You have given me because You loved me before the creation of the world. To move from communion or fellowship to this union. That the one flesh in a marriage hints at, points towards where we will be embraced into relationship with the triune God for all eternity. Yes, we struggle to wrap our minds around it. And we'll walk out saying that same thing that Ken said that Sunday so many years ago. Oh, I still don't get it. But what I want you to take away is the fact that we have a triune God means that love is at the essence of His character. And that is why He came as Jesus Christ and revealed Himself to us while we were yet sinners. And why, he'll, why He continues to dwell in us by His Holy Spirit, making us new. That we might not just converse with God and have communion with God, but we might experience union with God in the new heaven and the new earth. We give thanks that God is Trinity, even when we struggle to wrap our minds about what exactly that means. Let's pray. God our Father, We thank you for sending Jesus Christ, your Son, to reveal yourself to us that we might know you, that we might be convicted by your holiness and drawn to your love displayed on the cross of Jesus Christ, that we might be made new through his resurrection and the indwelling of your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we pray that you continue to renovate our hearts, to prepare us for deeper communion and ultimately union with you. A union that will not eliminate our personhood, but envelop us into a relationship of great intimacy and joy for all eternity. Lord, this is too lofty for us to understand. And so we declare with the psalmist, how precious to us are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Were we to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When we awake, we are still with you. Thank you for creating us in your image, for redeeming us through Jesus Christ, and for sanctifying us through your Holy Spirit. 
In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I've recommended the book before, but if you're looking for a, a book that is quite devotional, and I've really appreciated it, Delighting in the Trinity by Michael Reeves. He goes into a deep dive in a, a short book. I think it's 130 to 140 pages, pretty easy to read, and just looks at what's the implications of God the Father, and he does a very biblical job of that, and then Jesus Christ, and then the Holy Spirit, and what this means for us as believers. But Delighting in the Trinity is a, a really good book uh, by Michael Reeves. As we prepare to go out from here, I invite you to turn to 284, Father, I Adore You, 284 in the grave. After the benediction, we'll sing 318, the day you gave us, Lord, is ended. As you go from here to love and serve the Lord, go with his blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and fill you with his peace in Christ. Amen. Amen.